Um, hi, Sanjeev. Hi, everyone. Um, I People ascribe a big grand vision to uh, what uh, I've managed to accomplish. Uh, I'm sorry to say I don't have a grand vision. I was, I think, at the right place at the right time. Uh, I was at Cisco for uh, about 11 years. I was at your telecommunications technologist kind of person. But uh, due to a number of uh, reasons, I found myself um, starting an alliance of the world's largest nonprofits in the technology space. And that came out as Net Hope, N E T H O P E. And all of your well known uh, humanitarian, either Red Cross or Save the Children or Oxfam, everyone, doctors with our members. And uh, it was uh, the the back office of these organizations working with IT, working together while the front office competed with the for donor dollars. So it was quite an experience starting that up uh, with competing organizations working together. That led me to wanting to do something on the ground. Sitting here in San Jose at Cisco really wasn't uh, my ultimate goal. So I left my job. It was very scary because I was a lifetime paycheck earner to uh, start an organization called Anudeep Foundation um, based out of, I guess, where the Sundarbans, which is the mangrove delta where the Ganges and Brahmaputra flow out into the Bay of Bengal. Uh, starting with very uh, modest uh, beginnings with three centers in the, in the Sundarbans uh, in 2006, we grew uh, towards Kolkata, around Kolkata and into the rest of the country. Fast forward to today, to today, we have close to 100 centers serving uh, about 30,000 students every year, helping them. Uh, these are farm youth, uh, sorry, village youth, um, men and women who have a high school education, and we prepare them for jobs in the IT sector in India uh, with about 70 to 75% placement success. It's been very, very um, satisfying, and we moved with the IT industry as it's evolved in India. And I stepped down as CEO of Anudeep in April of 2019. And my latest thing is um, a new sector, in fact, healthcare, where we've just started our organization to make uh, low cost functional prosthetic arms for poor amputees in India and other developing countries. So it just happened to be something that I've been fortunate to be involved with applying technology to humanitarian missions worldwide. And um, that's really how it all happened. Very cool. So Deepak, before I jump to difficult question, I'm going to have an easy question. Okay. We both are privileged to attend IIT. And mm -hmm. IIT has awarded us a degree in engineering. My question is, can you define term engineering to our audience? What that means? Engineering, uh, what it means, and that this is a cold question. I've had no time to prepare. That's a big, and it's a big question, uh, is to make something or make something happen. Uh, that pretty much is what engineering is. It's taking one or two things, putting it together, either uh, and the things could be hardware actually tangible stuff or software and putting it together and um, making something uh, better uh, than the sum of the parts um, we've used uh, telecommunications uh, all through my life which ultimately led to the internet and the benefit of internet to our every breathing moment is is extremely well known so at Cisco, that was where I, and then uh, we've used technology to get people into IT jobs. We've got, we used technology to 3D printing technology to make prosthetic products. Uh, it really is, I think the fundamental unit of life uh, as, uh, as, we as we human beings are differentiated from other species. It is, engineering is what made us where we, where we are and where we are going. So if I may say, Deepak, to me, uh, when I think about what it means to be an engineer, and what I can summarize it very, uh, it's, it's an, our mindset of solving problems. When we say we are engineering a solution, actually there is a problem we are trying to solve. 
And what differentiate a person who doesn't think he's an engineer and we who believe we are an engineer is we look at every single problem as an opportunity to solve it. So what I'm trying to say it is every single human being is an engineer or can be an engineer if they are willing to give themselves a chance and learn or find ways to solve a problem. And that is what our event is about, our summit is about, IIT 2020. Mm -hmm. What we are calling it is we are inviting engineers of the future. So, and you are building these engineers, all these institutions you have, you, have, you are training 30,000 kids a year. In my opinion, they are the future of, they are the engineer of the future. They are- Absolutely, they are the future. They're in the 18 to 22 age group. And uh, that's our next generation in India of uh, leaders. Thank you, thank you. So people are asking this question from me, what this, uh, you are talking about uh, engineering the future. Well, where, where the hell are those engineers? I say, well, we have 7 billion of those and 3 billion more coming. I don't know what we will do with them. That's a different question. And that's where we need help deeper from you. How do we talk about global skill gaps? Because the biggest challenge I see is the way our society is evolving, especially in post-pandemic world. A skill gap is becoming a bigger and a bigger issue because a lot of skills which we have today or skills we used to consider great skills in 1950s to 2000 now has changed. Our world has completely changed. I'm pretty sure most of your institutions are running a lot of programs online now. So the infrastructure yeah. and everything has phenomenally changed. And this is going to be the new normal. We both know that. So the question I have for you is, what do you really see as the future of education? Uh, the future of education is um, to roll with, uh, to evolve with uh, opportunities. Uh, what, uh, you know, I think it was Einstein who said that uh, if you teach today's students with yesterday's education, you're not going to build tomorrow's uh, workforce. Or words to that effect, I'm kind of, I'm sure Einstein didn't say those exact words. But the point is that education is fundamental to, um, to success. And uh, success could be at any levels, but fundamentally, and then, yes, as the, as the world changes and things get more online, COVID or even otherwise, uh, people want a better quality of life, so don't want to be stuck in traffic or breathe, uh, breathe the smog. You, you, need to, you need to embrace new uh, technologies. And education isn't just an engineering degree or a master's degree. Education is every day. It, and now, the, really, the benefit of education, education's there. But somebody can benefit from education if they are open to learning. And that's a very important point. I've traveled almost in all, well, in India to different parts of the country, very rural, very urban, slums, uh, large communities, small communities. And I'm very, very hopeful of India because wherever I go, young people are very keen to learn and improve themselves. Parents from poor families who uh, tell us that, look, uh, maybe, uh, our lives are going to be this and this, but we believe our kids, our younger brothers, our, our sisters, uh, will be able to uh, do better. And they know what do better means because they see it on TV. And uh, can you help my kids to do better? And um, it's not necessarily the same in other countries, and I won't get into a geopolitical thing, but not everywhere are young people as excited about using education to improve themselves. And uh, we see it starkly, and then we see it in India that I think even though we have overpopulation, even though we have pollution, even though we have floods or uh, droughts or cold waves, everywhere people are willing to improve and leading to more competition, leading to more services, and keeping the economy rolling that way. That's uh, phenomenal, Deepak, and I completely echo with uh, you on uh, especially the future. 
uh, future of the world. Uh, just like you, I have traveled a lot of parts of the world. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, almost I'll say 18 countries in last before before uh, COVID uh, in last 12 months. So basically, anyway. So the point is, the desire and thirst for learning is so high; it's phenomenal. And that's where I believe there are opportunities, and that's where I believe there is a something we have to do together because we are all product of our environment. You and me are here because we got amazing education. Yes, yes. interaction. Yes, we did hundred other things, but in reality, without that education, I don't believe you and me will be even having this conversation today. I still yeah. remember my trip to uh, Calcutta Museum uh, in 89. Uh, if mm -hmm. you remember, I believe you are from Calcutta. Yes, I am. So in the museum, there were mirrors uh, yeah. placed in such a way that it feels like video conferencing, but they were using just mirrors. It was part of the museum. I visited in 89 when I was doing my training there. Now it's like, you know, just finished my high school pretty much. Mm -hmm. It was a video conferencing. And a kid yeah. like me sitting in that environment and thinking about how cool will it be to see people from far, just the way we are doing it now. Just like we're talking, yeah. And Deepak, yeah. you have, you are one of the pioneer of IP technology. So IP, uh, inter IP, internet protocol. Yeah. No, so you uh, were very involved in uh, developing Cisco's voice over IP and Metro Ethernet technology. Yeah, I was, I was a voice over IP product line manager there and product director, yeah. So I remember when I went for my interview to Cisco, it was ultimate, my final interview was with a pretty senior vice president. And uh, I'm talking about 1995. And I, at that time, so I asked him that, that hey, look, you've got this telephone network and you've got this data network, they're separate, right? Um, the data communications and voice. Couldn't we combine the two and send voice over uh, this? And he looked at me very, very strangely. And I th at, later I realized he was, a, had, did some Cisco secret get out? And I, and I, and I'm, and actually I'm not. I, I was just thinking it makes sense to merge the net and that's yeah. what, Cisco happened and voice over IP was and you had to simulate all the signals that are in the phone, the dial tone, the busy tone, all of that in a data network and a lot of that um, capabilities. But, you know, that's what took Cisco to where it is. And it was indeed very exciting to be able to be part of that uh, revolution. Yeah. So, you know, the, so I'm so excited when I start, uh, I was thinking about talking to you and I got an opportunity to speak to you. I say, you are one of the few people who were the early, I will say almost like, you're like a Renaissance man for a lot of ideas. Oh no, I'm not a Renaissance man. I'm a geek at heart. <laughs> I have to tell you this story that um, I left Cisco in 2006 and did nonprofit work right through, didn't do any technology. And uh, Cisco actually has also been a donor to our, to Anudeep. And I was invited to the uh, to a uh, to the Cisco Live user conference where about 28, 30,000 people come. It was at Las Vegas, and uh, I gave the talk to a the select group of CIOs that Cisco had invited. Talked about uh, Philanthra and how technology Cisco uh, is helping people in India through Anadeep. And then rest of the time, I had a free ticket to visit any uh, tech discussion. There were really hardcore tech people there. And I went to security conferences, encryption conferences, and I just loved it. And I felt that, you know, that, that telecom gene, which has been in, in, inserted into me by Dr. Uh, Jay Das or G.S. Sanyal of IIT Kharagpur still resounds in me. And I'm fundamentally a techno techie at heart. I so, know a lot of fans of Professor Sanyal. I hear yeah. that name so many times. He's a legend, right. I believe. Yeah, and Johnny Das was also another legend. He taught us information uh, theory, which uh, is fundamental to all of this stuff. So we came a long way, and now you have started uh, this prosthetic arm startup. Why? Well, uh, 
a lot of reasons why that's, we got into 3D printing first and then we are looking for a killer application for 3D printing. Uh, we, this is about three years ago and 3D printing is nice if you may, if you put it, you can afford it, you can get a 3D printer for your home and make whatever, uh, Taj Mahal or you can make a you know, teddy bear or whatever. And, uh, and we happened on one, we happened on an application and it was 3D printed prosthetics. And in India, uh, we, and this was helped by, uh, I think, a, a Fulbright scholar who uh, came to intern with us. And she uh, brought, and she brought a prosthetic arm with her. And anyway, long story short, in, in, uh, especially in developing countries, prosthetic arms, which is uh, artificial arm for an amputee who's had a factory accident or a traffic accident or a, or a birth defect, the solutions are either non-existent or they are very ancient technologies, like our Hindustan ambassador, and who've been there for a long time. And it's heavy if you take your normal arm and your prosthetic, uh, you know, artificial arm is twice as heavy. Very little functionality it requires a lot of effort to make the hand open and close. So we got into that and we came up with some solutions which have been very well received. And um, it, not, and we use some electronics and um, motors to make less less effort required to open close and rest, um, and do some stuff which are which. So we restore. Uh, when a person loses an arm, they lose about seventy percent of their livelihood ability, and a prosthetic arm won't restore all of it. We restore about forty or fifty percent of it. But with that, you know, someone who's a vegetable seller or a truck driver or a para, Paralympic sportsman or even just a housewife or a kid who wants to play cricket uh, is is huge and uh, we have now just beginning to roll that out in a big way uh, as a social enterprise so it's uh, something just again like i said at the beginning no grand vision just happened to be there and with a market that is r literally ripe for technology innovation and uh, benefits uh, benefiting a very large Syrian refugees, people who have been victims of minefields, all kinds of people who we can benefit. It's an unfortunate thing. In fact, I'm on the board of TCNJ, and uh, one of my friends actually, we were together in IIT Delhi. He heads the biotech department there, so biomechanical actually. Yeah, he's yep. working on the material, which uh, is uh, his goal is to develop a material which is almost identical to bone. Because even today, when we do surgery and the plates and metal we put, it's not the same. And it, it is helping people. People are able to do things, but it is damaging a lot of other parts of the body because now yeah. this part is stronger than the other part of the body. And it doesn't have the similar uh, capabilities uh, of uh, bone as bone. So it's a very complex problem. I'm so glad you are working on it. It's just a phenomenal uh, uh, Thank idea. Thank you. This is this is a great. There's a lot we can do. Yeah. So uh, so the question I have for you, Deepak, is what role curiosity has played in your life? Because it seems like uh, when you say it is not by plan, so I'm assuming that you are just curious about solving some of these problems, and then you say, "Hey, why not me? Why why somebody else?" Can I say that? Uh, curiosity um, is fundamental, as fundamental as education, I guess. And, uh, and uh, I guess curiosity is there in non-humans also. But curiosity is something we are born with. Uh, we keep asking our parents, why is the grass green? Why is the sky blue? And parents say, Are, don't bother me. It's, it's blue, it's blue. But if you take the time to explain to someone why the sky is blue, why the colors are filtered out and only green reflects back from the grass, you help them. So I keep uh, giving, telling these stories to the, when I used to visit the training centers of Anudeep and there were these kids who would be in the class and they'd be absolutely intimidated by the CEO coming in. And to get them to talk, I'd ask them, well, tell me why is the grass green? And they would think I was crazy. Uh, and anyway, so and I tell them that, look, you ask these questions when you were a kid and, and a generation of par not parents, not so much, but teachers have beaten up that curiosity out of you to just learn by rote, learn what I tell you, open the book. And unless you keep asking questions and unless you're curious, uh, you will be just that. You'll be just do what you're told. You won't do anything proactive, anything that needs leadership, risk taking. 
And I think curiosity is, is absolutely a fundamental uh, trait that we need to develop. So uh, question I have for you, since you're running a lot of these training institutions, or you set it up, you're the founder, can it be taught? Can you teach curiosity? No, you can't teach curiosity. You have, you don't need to teach it. I think curiosity coupled with another factor, which is a passion to do something, to strongly want to do something. And then you could want to, it's usually you want to correct something that's wrong. In, in uh, say, the Vispala, the prosthetic company case, that there are these old um, arms, and I want to give a, a, a taxi driver or truck driver an arm that you can use. Um, I feel that passionately, there is something we have to do because you know so many people around the world are living without uh, an essential thing like a hand. Everybody has a right to a hand, right? Yeah. And and they're not, uh, <laughs> they don't have that. Um, so I'm passionately, and then I want to find new things. Luckily, I'm surrounded by curious people too, and different ways to make it successful, make it better than what solutions are there. Uh, you don't, you have to, you can't teach curiosity. I think you have to give, give uh, kids the opportunity to be curious. Don't tell them the answers and let them, let them find out for themselves. Let them ask more. Critical thinking is, an, is the, you know, the other, end, other side of the coin from curiosity. Think, find the answers yourselves, deploy the answers. If it fails, doesn't matter, try again, and ultimately you'll succeed. I mean, it's, it's so fundamental that it's, uh, it's, a, it's really a travesty that we've beaten it out of young people in, uh, in uh, many schools. But it takes a good te- by the way, it, take, it takes a good teacher to develop those things because then you have to manage each student differently and not like a one mass. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, no, absolutely, <laughs> Deepak. I am just uh, talking about the same thing. So the reason I brought that question is uh, I realize if I look back my whole life and every single person I have interviewed uh, for this uh, interviewed close to 34 people for our series, in fact, video series. And they all are phenomenally successful in their industry or in their space or the areas they are working on, such as you are, uh, most of your life you have to spend educating kids, creating a better life for them. Uh, the same way I talked to another person, his name is Deepak Chopra, who runs FEA India, another nonprofit, very similar to what you're doing, and they are doing amazing work in North. What I find it is all of you are curious in nature. And that got me thinking that if curiosity is the answer, then why not come up or think of ways that I can create or can it be taught? Because in so many years of our life, in the beginning part where our parents or our uh, teachers said, oh no, this is like this, and we are forced to start believing that, oh, the sky is blue and I should not question it. It requires a serious reboot so our society can start thinking of the future and the future not what it is today, the future they want to create. And that require an amazing, that require a lot of work when it comes to curiosity. You and me both know we have to unlearn so much. We have learned in the last 20, 30 decades. Especially well, as- um, I think uh, the ability to be curious also varies. Not everybody, uh, some people prefer to be uh, reg- live, uh, learn in a regimented manner. I'm also involved with another foundation in the US where we teach democratic, uh, a democratic way of teaching to science teachers or STEM teachers. And that uh, really is, I was talking about critical thinking which is the op- and, uh, other side of curiosity. So it takes a special type of teacher to develop curiosity in the, in the kids, and you can't do it through books. A great example was um, uh, one teacher gave a project uh, trying to get kids to learn about um, bacteria. So they're just bored with bacteria, but they said, look, take these, this measuring unit 
and find out if there's more bacteria in a girl's bathroom or a boy's bathroom in the school. And man, they all got involved and they, they just did a great study or all kinds of things, uh, something about beer having more, uh, not uh, drinking it, whether which has more uh, whatever, um, malt or, or something. So all of these, these experiments, which require curiosity, and then some people really get into it and, uh, and others, and then they form groups and which kids don't like to learn in a group. They like to, you know, so getting uh, um, group projects going, all of these things um, are ways to develop curiosity, but it takes, uh, it takes special teacher to uh, take the, because as it is, you have to prepare your kids for uh, exams, you know, board exams, regents exams, Around that, you also have to do this form of uh, behavioral modification so that kids can ultimately become curious, which is fundamental to a STEM or a scientific, uh, and then ultimately engineering uh, expertise. So uh, since you mentioned about Sundarvan, if I'm not mistaken, uh, there was a nonprofit did a hole in the wall experiment where they put a computer in the rural area was that your organization or different organization? No, we didn't. Uh, that's been done in many places. Probably the most um, and I uh, most um, well-known example is in the barrios of Brazil, uh, in the, the slums of Brazil, in Rio, of Rio, Rio de Janeiro. Nice. There's this fellow called Baggio. I think Roberto Baggio. I think his name was, and I know him from many many years ago. And he did that. He put uh, in one of the, the barrios, he put a, a laptop in the wall with nothing, no instruction, nothing. And kids within uh, 20 minutes had gotten to Disneyland, Disney and gotten to the beginning to play games. This is some time ago. Yeah, ki in, in, kids are very intuitive. And uh, you can now see three-year-olds, four-year-olds um, happily playing with uh, video, video apps. Yeah. So the reason I'm bringing that up is uh, the big learning from that lesson, which uh, I, I saw the, what uh, impact it has. The learning is more collaborative. So we learn from our friends, we learn from the peers, we learn more from them than the just teachers, because teachers are there teaching, but with the students and other uh, kids around us or the environment taught us more. So how are you bringing that experiential learning in your environment and especially the institutions you are involved in? Yeah, at Anulik Foundation, we um, initially began with the straight-jacketed way that uh, to learn how to learn English, how to learn job readiness, how to learn computers, computers IT. Um, and then over time, we have moved to blended learning and which is much more um, uh, self-learning. We give them, a, we use a lot of apps which we and uh, so blended learning can be on a smartphone, on a tablet, or on a on a desktop. And the look and feel is the same through our learning management system. And uh, we give them a lot of different uh, ways to uh, find out the answers themselves, play games, work together. Uh, I think a, we, there's a lot we can do still, but still, you know, these kids come from about as wrote learning backgrounds as possible. Villages of the Sundarbans Ho, villages of Gujarat or villages of Jharkhand. Um, it's, it's very difficult for them to step away and take, a, a, take, a, take the initiative or take a, take a decision or take a risk. No, sir, please, you tell me. And then, or if you ask a question, there's no answer. And you have to get them involved. So it's, at, we have a, you know, a three month course, so there's only so much you can do. But one of the basic things we try to do is to get them out of that mode of learning, that mode of thinking. And uh, if we can do that, and when we do that, many of our students have gone on to do really well in corporate America, uh, corporate India. That's very cool. That's phenomenal. So uh, I have another question for you. It's a very easy question, I think. I, I picked all the easy questions for you, Deepak. <laughs> the hard one's coming. <laughs> so, yes, this is the hardest question. So if you can go back in time and meet anyone, mm. who will that be and why? Um, my, uh, one of the 
I can, uh, I, well, two people compete for that. So class six in Sinsilia's Calcutta. Uh, yeah, I'll, uh, so uh, Mr. Roy uh, was a Bengali teacher. Uh, my English was pretty good even in those days. And because of him, my Bengali became good. But that wasn't the reason. He somehow got me in. He, he used to give us uh, books to read from which are outside the curriculum. And he gave one or two books about adventures. And I remember still Raj Kahani, uh, which was written by, I think, um, uh, not Rabindranath Tagore, but Abhinindranath, or one of, his, one of the Tagore family. And it got me very excited about the possibilities and adventures of people. And I kind of developed, I think, uh, an adventurous streak in me to do things differently, to get excited about other people doing adventurous things. And I, in the process, my Bengali in, in, improved significantly. So there you go. It's it's called uh, democratic teaching. It got me excited in those stories, and and it was in Bengali, sir. And that's even now the foundation I'm working here does pretty much the same thing. The other person was the uh, former CEO of Cisco. His name is John Morgridge. Uh, he was the head of the uh, company which, when it went public in 1995. He was a giant of philanthropy, and there are lots of stories about him, but uh, fundamentally, uh, he used to come as a keynote speaker to NetHope, the consortium I'm telling you about. And when I was going to leave Cisco to start Anudeep, I was really, really nervous, you know. So he, I went to see him for advice, and uh, he by then was the chairman of Cisco. John Chambers had taken over and everything. And I sat across from him, and he listen to what I was going to do on a deep. And he said, uh, ask me to, I have three questions for you. The first question was, do you want to do it? I said, yeah, I really, really want to do it. Okay. Then he said, um, do you think it'll succeed? And I think there's a very strong possibility. We have done some field studies and all. I think I can make it work. There's a lot of people I can benefit. And he said, can you afford it? And at that time, my wife was uh, working. She was with uh, with a company doing well. And I said, okay, I think I should be able to financially be able to do it. Then he said, so what are you doing in my office? Uh, go and do it. And pretty much next month, I left Cisco and I was in the Sundarbans. So John Morgridge is a huge influence on my life and on my post-Cisco life as a, as a humanitarian. Amazing. That's no, really amazing. <laughs> so uh, another question I have for you is, uh, do you have any challenge for our audience, especially IIT alumni, as well as the students? Uh, we have 123,000 students right now in 23 IITs, and they are looking for challenges because you and me both know we are here, we, we thrive on challenges. Most of us love challenges. Well, I have a very, very uh, positive view of IIT students, uh, current students and recent IIT students. Uh, I am amazed at these. I, by the way, I go back to IIT almost every two or three months, Kharagpur campus, because we have a joint project with the robotics department. So we are building uh, brain-powered prosthetic arms in partnership with the mechanical engineering department under which robotics is. So I get to meet a lot of young students, PhD scholars, even BTECs, and I've given a couple of speeches at uh, talks at IIT in different, um, I can't believe how focused they are on helping people through technology. It, and in my time, I have to say, I was you know, cricket, football, whatever, um, you know, music, and study, get through your exams, and get, get, get some good marks and get a job. That was all I worried about. But today's kids are very different, and it's it's a large percentage. And I'm sure there are people who are not that committed. So I think if you uh, you have to worry about if you're a young person to build your career, build your families, uh, you know, um, all of that is is hard work, and it's uh, so. But while you do that, look around and help others. And helping others doesn't have to be um, somebody in the Sundarbans. It could be somebody around you. Um, excite people, talk about your work in an exciting way so that others want to do the same thing you're doing. So I'm very hopeful about um, 
the you know and that's iit i've seen stanford business school kids um you know when i talk i gave on social entrepreneurship i couldn't believe these were stanford business school kids who were so motivated to use a uh, build a social enterprise and uh, so i feel very excited about that deepak i can't thank you enough for your time today uh, is there any oh, uh, my pleasure. message for uh, our audience anything you would like to say um find your passion and add that to curiosity and you've got it made deepak i can't thank you enough for joining us today no, and supporting my pleasure IIT and globally. and okay. uh, what i learn are two things education and learning never ends we should continue as long as Absolutely. we are curious we can we can solve all the problems of the world am i correct absolutely um, all of those all of that is true thank you i'm sanjeev thank goyal you. conference chair of iid2020.org pan iid usa's mega virtual event join us co invent and co define paradigms for this new world our event is open to all please register at www.iit2020.org thank you